cover areas trying to implement Agile in a specific project or portfolio. But Agile implementation doesn't happen in a vacuum. It happens within the organization ecosystem. What if the organization is too heavy? The structure and the culture of the organization doesn't really support Agile implementation. How difficult it would be. So it's like cycling on uneven surface uphill, right? And that's what I meant by saying non-agile word. So the agenda for today is I am going to share the context of case study. I am going to talk about some of the agile implementation challenges which we face. I am also going to talk about the agile journey. I will also talk about the next step which we are planning to take uh, to move further on the agile journey. And in the end, I will wrap up with a summary of learnings. And obviously, there will be Q&A in the in, in the middle and in the end. All right. So let's get started. Let me quickly provide the project context. So it was a banking system with multiple customers, retail, corporate, private banking across the globe, and 24 plus 7 customer facing mission critical system. There were multiple channels such as branch, telephony, and internet. So this system was developed around 2005-2006 to take advantage of internet boom. But instead of creating the whole system from scratch, we got a Java front-end built on top of mainframe legacy backend. So what we got in long term is a legacy tightly coupled system with slow development issues. And this was being supported by a dedicated but distributed team. And we got multiple stakeholders who were constantly putting one request to make various changes, various enhancements in the system. So let me give you a flavor of the kind of changes we were getting. So there were regulatory changes. When I say regulatory, it was kind of changes resulted from various legislation, anti-money laundering, foreign tax invasion, and so on. There were strategic enhancements. So the example of this would be like enhancement to shorten the customer journey or improving the conversion. There were issues reported by production support team, and they wanted a permanent fix. There were new product launches and customization. There were campaigns and offers. So these were the kind of changes and all of these were being delivered in the form of multiple waterfall projects. And we obviously had a lot of issues around timelines and quality. So let me also talk about the organization context and some other challenges. So this was a matrix organization, a pretty heavy organization. If you look at most of the big organizations, they are divided into horizontals, verticals, department, divisions. But unless there is a specific collaboration focus, over a period of time, you will see misalignment. There will be lack of synergies between various units. They will have conflicting priorities. So that was the situation. Between business and technology, it was more of contract negotiation versus collaboration. Similarly, with the support function, most of the time, they were just hiding behind SLAs. So think of a situation. You are a scrum team. You are committed to meet your sprint goal. And you need a help from support group. And they say, oh, we have a SLA of two weeks. Your sprint duration is two weeks. How is it going to work? So that was the situation. It was driven by hierarchy. I'm not saying hierarchy is bad. All I'm saying is there are some issues with too much hierarchical organizations. The decision making is slow. Previous one? When I say support function, I am talking mostly infrastructure group. You want a server setup. You want a database administrator. So the issue with the hierarchy is the decision. The other aspect with, with the hierarchy is many times people see the growth in terms of getting the bigger job title rather than making the right kind of impact. So that changes the mentality. And what if there is a hierarchy within the team? The whole idea of self-organization is just not going to work. And then it was also a management heavy organization. When there are multiple issues in the organization, what do failure indicates? The failure typically indicates the complexity in the system. And beyond the limit, the complexity can be best tackled by adaptive methods. Right? But many times in management heavy organization, people see, oh, here, there is a failure. Okay, let's put more processes, more controls to tackle this. It is counterproductive. And this command and control mentality comes in the way of agile implementation. 
they were heavy processes, lots of checklists, lots of documents, lots of multiple approval boards. But more than the amount of processes, the problem was one size fits all approach. The processes were, were rigid with little room for customization. How it is problematic? The, in ideal world, the agile team should be empowered to design its own processes within a broader framework of agile principles. Otherwise, the processes become overhead. As the manifesto says, working software over processes and tools. Right? The other issue was around technical agility. Can we get the business agility without technical agility, especially when IT is a key enabler? Yes or no? Can we? So that was another issue. We got a system which was IT covered. Now what I meant by tight coupling is, so different system components are dependent on each other. <coughs> if you are changing one component, you have to change other components. Or at least you have to do a lot of analysis and testing to ensure you have not broken something unintentionally. And there was a slow development, it was like a snail, slow development. Now think of a situation, a tiny little feature or tiny little change takes multiple weeks. How on earth we are going to apply the idea of frequent delivery and frequent feedback? That's not going to work. The other issue with the technical agility was around lack of tools and infrastructure. When I say lack of tools, I am talking about tools like continuous integration tool. When I say infrastructure, I am talking about, for example, test environment. So instead of having a dedicated environment, you have got a shared environment, which has got its own nuances. So to tackle all of these issues, I tried to convince management to apply agile. And you can imagine the kind of response I would have received. So the response was quite like, say, there is so much issue around scope creep, and you are saying we start doing development without baselining and covering all the requirements, putting all of these in a big document. Or I was told, how on earth we are talking about simplifying processes wherein there is so much chaos, there is a dire need of putting more control, more governance. So that's the kind of responses I received. So I was pondering on what approach to take now. So before I talk further, I let you read this till word. I hope you can read it. So here Dilbert's boss is thinking that just by removing chairs, just by using a dress code and having a standard image is going to solve all the problems of automation. Right? So the message here is sometimes we solve the wrong problems or sometimes our approach is wrong. So while I was pondering on what approach to take now after the initial defeat, there, there was a major production issue, huge crisis. Suddenly I was in the firing line, I was in the management spotlight, tough questions were being asked. But this is the same, every cloud has got a silver lining. And the silver lining here was, every time I was going through the hierarchy, and this time suddenly I got the attention from the top managers. The key here was to really articulate the problem, come with the action plan, and this time I was much more careful. So I was trying to speak in a language which they understand. So what I proposed is, the issue is, there are too many stakeholders. There is a huge demand and supply mismatch. Now how that is affecting? There are interdependencies between various work requests leading to dialogue. Building consensus among the stakeholder itself is a nightmare. Because there is a mismatch between demand and supply, there are flow jumps. Because demand is more than supply, somewhere, you know, invariably team will cut corners and there will be quality issue. And how that is affecting? That's what resulting into poor time to market and production disruptions. <coughs> so when I explained this, naturally the response was, okay, we, we see that, we understand it. Now what is the solution? So here is what I proposed. First part of the proposal was to have a dedicated product owner. It sounds like no-brainer, but it is it is a big structure change in a you know command and control big hierarchical organization. So my idea of getting a product owner was somebody who can coordinate with stakeholders, somebody who can manage, who is authorized, who is empowered to manage the dependencies, somebody who can split the work. Somebody who can drive the development, somebody who can drive the user acceptance as team and things like that. It need not be a single individual. It can be a team wherein an individual is supported by quality analysis, business analysis. So that was first part of the proposal. The second part of the proposal was, instead of doing two big work requests, let's divide the work request. Now how dividing the work is going to happen? So two ways. One is that if we, bigness means complexity. If we divide the work, 
we are containing the complexity. Also, it helps in matching demand versus supply. So, do smaller work. Secondly, when you divide the big chunk of work into small chunks, you will get multiple small chunks of different priorities. So, this also helps us in working on the right kind of priorities. The third part of the proposal was combining multiple work requests and doing quarterly releases. When I say quarterly releases, the start to finish lead time is not three months, it's actually six months. It's just that we are doing releases in parallel. So every three months we, we can have a production deployment. Now you would think what kind of process I am pr proposing. But anyways, so I propose to management that if we do this, they are going to get more control, more visibility. So if you say this thing to a command and control mentality person, he's going to love it. So the proposal got accepted and over a period of time we were able to reach to this particular model. Now you would think how agile it is, it's nothing but an iterative waterfall. Right? It is, I don't disagree with that. Every time when there is a broken waterfall process, that's not always an opportunity to implement the agile. Sometimes a well working waterfall process is a better starting point to start the agile journey. And that's what I was trying to do here. So, still it was because it was iterative waterfall, so there were issues like issues of scope creep, issues of ad hoc work request, the change was costly and discouraged. Every time we got a change, we were between rock and hard place. Either we have to say no to the change, or we say, okay, this, it's going to uh, take more time, or we have to push out more scope. So, it was always a tough call. Thirdly, these kind of situations were more coming because six months was still a long period. Right? There were other issues such as slow development, release overheads, quality issues, governance overheads. These were still there, obviously, because we didn't do anything about these. All we did is solve one problem that was about having multiple stakeholders by putting a product on a team. But if you think about the agile implementation, I think this was a very important milestone achieved. At least we reached to a place wherein Agile implementation journey, we can start on. So we put together a transition backlog. Now transition backlog was obviously a big list of action items, but broad, broadly it contained three parallel tracks. The tracks were around putting more collaboration, bringing more feedback loops, and most importantly bringing technical engineering. So I am going to talk about these one by one. So let me first talk about technical agility. How to bring technical agility any thoughts? Anyone? Refactoring. Yeah. What else? Continuous delivery. Integration. Continuous delivery. Anything else? Multi learning. Yes, level approach. Good thoughts. So, more or less, that's what we did. We put together a technical backlog containing all the legacy possible issues which were coming in our way in priority order code related issues or architectural enhancements. We also come up with a backlog of testing improvement and automation. We did a lot of brainstorming to come up with reusable tools. We also work with support groups to improve the infrastructure. When I say infrastructure, I am talking about kind of getting tools for continuous integration or building more test environments. And we also adopted practices like peer programming and test development. So by doing all of these, we improve the technical agility. Now, I am not saying we solved all the problems, but we at least reached to a place where the idea of frequent delivery was at least making some sense. So it was like giving wheels to the snake. Now, I talked about doing technical enhancement. Now, technical enhancement might be disruptive. It might be a change in existing production code or architecture. <coughs> now, do you think business is going to support it? Who is going to test it? Who is going to ensure that there is no unintended impact? Who's going to fund it? Just think about a situation. You are saying business. Okay, hey, let's change the Microsoft Access database to manage in your MySQL. Are they going to fund it? Rarely. If you highlight the operational list, saying that if you don't do this technical upgrade, there is going to be a security breach or maybe the system may crash in the peak sale event. They might listen, but still, generally, business approach is more reactive. So it's very difficult to get support from business. So what we did is, we tried to piggyback our technical enhancements with work requests. So it was like, you know, a team member may say, 
Okay, so this work request of this feature is going to take x amount of time or x and x points. The other team member might remind him, hey, did you not check a technical backlog? The kind of component this feature will touch are the items which are having more most <coughs> issues around most legacy issues. So let's add more effort. So that's how we were trying to uh, retain balance between the strategic versus tactical. So, but, yeah. uh, so you're saying you were really banking on the, on the business of right? So depending on yeah. these efforts on A little bit of it. You can't always have. Uh, see, estimate is a, you know, FYG thing. Business, whatever estimate, if business is suspicious, whatever, if, even if you give your genuine estimate, they are going to question you. So they are going to question you in any case. Sometimes, over a period of time, when we got more trust with business, we were able to really explain them. But initially, yeah, initially we were just making those small amount of piggybacking with each work request. But uh, any other way we did initially to make that uh, understand that whether it is actually required, amount of uh, investment we are going in changing the company's set of uh, tool set and all those So we didn't do any quantitative study as such. But it, these were things which came out in the kind of team discussion with the testing team, with the development team. When we were talking with the team, it clearly came out unless we kind of, for example, like for one functionality, there were two different type of logic. Now, whenever you need to make a change, you need to change here, you need to change there. How about kind of putting this together and create a reusable module? So, first time it may take a little extra effort, but over a period of time, it's going to save up. Uh, yeah, little extra buffer considering that there is going to be a refactoring also. So it's not just uh, these two duplicate uh, duplicate code are present in the system. We are just going to change both of these. So instead of changing both of these separately and test it separately, let's combine together and create a reusable module. Even if that means initially having little 10 percent, 20 percent extra effort. <coughs> So while we were working on the technical agility in parallel, we were also working on collaboration practices. So there were general practices such as putting a daily stand up, the task board, we were also trying to bring in collaboration tools such as WebEx, Wiki, SharePoint, and obviously other practices such as pair programming and brainstorming, tech at us, these, these were all already working well. But we tried to maximize this by putting practices such as pairing metrics. Now do you know what is pairing metrics? It's nothing but kind of simple metrics showing who is pairing with whom for how many days. So it helps in pair rotation. Another issue which I talked previously was around team distribution. So team was distributed based on speciality. The Java team in Chennai, mainframe team in Goa. And obviously they had dependencies on each other. But there was generally a throw over the wall attitude, which was not really working well. See, pairing generally a lot of management typically suspicious about like two people doing one person's job. But let me give you an example. You are going on a road and there are lots of zigzag turns and you are not sure about the path. You are driving, so you are driving, you are focusing on the bumps on the road. But here is a person sitting next to you who is thinking strategically, who is looking at the map and trying to find out what is the most optimum. So in pairing, the main advantage is like two brains are better than one, especially when you are working on the complex work. So one person is generally thinking on the strategic aspects, other person is thinking on the immediate technical issues. Other thing people do is, many times one person is coding, other person is kind of writing the test. So it becomes quite like an intellectual challenge. So that's how it helps. So okay, I was talking about team distribution, so that was the issue. While I was trying to put collaboration tools, one thing I realized, whatever we do, there is going to be some communication gap. Nothing can replace the beauty of face-to-face -face communication. So either we bring all the team at one location, but somehow that was not practically visible. So what we tried to do is to build independent team at each location by having all the specialities at each location. So that we can divide the work into logical chunks and these things, the cross-location dependencies will be less. And the 
intermediate dependencies can obviously be tackled by having more uh, travel and using collaboration. So we rebalance that. We also added feedback loops in the form of uh, customer showcases, in the form of retrospective, mostly in the form of a stop, a start, continue. Stop means the practices which are not working well, let's stop these. Continue means the practices which are working well, let's continue and optimize. Start means the practices which we should adopt now to improve further. Uh, yes, one uh, Yeah, I know. Sometimes we just have to be pragmatic. So, as I said, the priority preference was really to bring to have a team on a single location. That was the preference, but somehow that was not possible because of number of organization constraints. So, the most pragmatic thing was let's have an independent team and and do a more and divide the work in such a way so that they work independently. Still, there will be collaboration needs. So, for that, we are putting some collaboration practices such as putting wiki, SharePoint. WebEx, daily stand up over the video conference, and so on. See, Agile is after all about art of possibility. We have to deal with organization constraints. We also worked on the training and coaching. On the previous slide. Yeah. Uh, like uh, when we say that we are showcasing our whatever the delivery which we have made, or, yeah. uh, we are showcasing it to the stakeholder, to the customer. Yeah. And at the same time, we need to sh uh, show them that we have developed a major chunk. At the same time, we have to see that we are uh, uh, meeting the compliances which are required. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, and if we are getting again the feedback on that, so again, <coughs> uh, whatever the plan which you have devised. Will, will go to I, I'll, I'll cover that plan, but yeah, compliance is one thing which is all, all, always a uh, you know nuisance. And but generally, more than the stakeholders, our PMOs, our quality assurance functions are more worried about these. Yes. So I'll cover that in subsequent slides. So we also worked on agile training and coaching, which is no brainer. Training was to understand, to ensure all team members understand the framework. Coaching was more on the ongoing basis to ensure there is a self-organized team motivated team. And next, as you, you were talking about compliance and you know nuances of quality <coughs> assurance, processes and so on. So then we, we saw it as a major challenge. So the deal here was to really get a hearing with the authorities, which was really a big deal. So what we did is we kind of joined head with other people, like-minded people who were also trying to make similar kind of impact. And together, somehow, we were able to get a hearing with the authorities. And our case was quite simple. We are not saying the processes that we have designed are bad. We really understand and appreciate those. We see the processes have got a purpose. All we are saying here is, we can better meet the same purpose by making slight customizations in the process. So the deal here is, you, you really need to talk in the language which the other person understands and appreciates, rather than just going for a criticism. So they allowed us. Some of us volunteered to uh, work alongside with PMOs and QA functions to customize these processes. So let me give you an example of the kind of customization we got. Do you understand what is traceability matrix? Yeah. So it's nothing but a mapping between top level requirement to the next level requirement to a low level requirement. Sometimes going all the way till build artifact <coughs> testing artifacts. The idea is we are not missing anything. Right? How about instead of creating a separate document? How about we just customize our backlog in a way we meet the same purpose by having a traceability between work request to the EFICO feature to the user story and maybe to the acceptance test. Right. So that's a kind of customization we brought in. So we talked a lot about kind of interventions we made. Right. Let me now show you the current model. So that's a current model. Sounds complicated, but let me explain. So we reduce the lead time instead of quarterly releases to our release every eight weeks. But to achieve this, there are three releases running in parallel. But at a time, only one release is in the development cycle, which is shown by these arrows. Now, this development cycle is not really iterative waterfall. The team is really self-organized, governed by the by the release backlog. They are signing up features, stories based on the priorities. 
they are doing whatsoever needed design, development, testing in any given sequence to deliver working software frequently and there are feedback loops in terms of showcases. Uh, so how did you solve that problem of infrastructure uh, in terms of multiple environments you get for this and so on? You see by collaboration we reached to somewhere, we didn't solve all the problems, there are still nuances around it. But by taking help of the authorities, by collaborating with the performing organization, we got some extra funds to build up some of the test environments. So the problem partially still exists, but lesser than what we have got previously. So basically the management was quite receptive in terms of understanding the Still they are. Still, <laughs> still they are. It's just that we, at least we uh, made it little better. Yeah. Okay, so, so this development cycle, so basically what we are doing is rather than putting together a separate big Excel document showing the traceability between requirement 1, 2, 3 and then functional specification, we are saying we don't follow the big requirement specification document. All we have got is this backlog. So rather than creating big documents and putting together a traceability, we are having all our requirements captured in the form of backlog. And there is a traceability here. It's not that we are losing the track. Work requests are getting divided into features and epics. These features and epics are getting divided into user stories. So there is a traceability. We are not losing track. We don't have a risk of missing requirements. That was the argument. So okay, so current model, three releases running in parallel, one release in the development cycle at any given point of time, and second release in hardening. Now what we were doing in the hardening, end-to-end -end user acceptance testing, non-functional testing, backout testing, and so on. Now you would say why there is so much of hardening. Why your Dundon criterion is so loose? Well, ideally, we should have a potentially shapeable product coming out of this development cycle. Ideally. But we are in a real world. There are constraints related to test environment. For example, we need to link with external agencies such as trade trading agency. But that linkage is not there in the development environment. Non-functional testing can be done in a separate environment and that environment is available <coughs> for a short duration. There are different licensing issues or load runner licenses. There are specialization issues. For example, we want to do security testing, but we don't have specialization. We are dependent on the third party agency. But that agency cannot be brought in for entire development phase. That's not practical, it will cost a lot. So these kind of you know reasonable reasons or constraints we, we have got, because of which we got a little longer hardening period. And the third release at any point of time will be in the scoping. When I say scoping, it's about release planning, it's about uh, breaking down the work request into feature, features into stories, and writing stories. And uh, uh, the community support and other support uh, for fixing and other things. So part, yeah, part of UAT is done in the development cycle itself, but there are some part of UAT, for example, linkage with the external agencies, some part of UAT that cannot be practically done in the same environment. So we were doing it in a separate environment as part of hardening. Right. And you were, uh, you were containing the capacity available? Yes. So what we were doing is at any point of time, one development pair on rotation was kind of dedicated to work on either hardening or deployment. And some capacity was also getting into the scoping related discussions. So typically what do you mean? So for example, we got a four dev pair. So out of four dev pairs, we were always planning new work, current release work only for three dev pairs. Because one pair was always on rotation working on the hardening or deployment. So that's a kind of, you know, sort of uh, division. Yeah, but then that would be event based, right? So you may not be seeing so many defects with what you anticipate. Actually, we have uh, got a lot of issues. But generally, if let's say this dev pair is free, so they can work on the technical enhancements. We were always keeping that capacity aside. Showing for the release one, they are working at the, uh, the for the release two, they are also started scoping, release planning, yeah. estimating. So, so some capacity, some capacity, yeah. for example, are taking the PA. Some capacity is, is also so one dev pair. I said we are putting aside, so that dev pair is helping on the hardening. 
they are helping on deployments, they are helping on some of these scoping related discussions. So we are kind of putting aside some capacity to support the other two activities in that. But doesn't you, I mean over here the context switching, whenever we try to do such models, people find when you are doing planning, when you are doing uh, these kind of story writing estimation, first of all you want the whole team to be there yep. and second thing is that requires a lot of meeting and a lot of things would be there on your See, calendar. Ideally we say that we should involve the entire team but sometimes that's not pragmatic. What we do here is, so one dev pair is dedicated but if this dev pair need help and it's not that one dev pair is always dedicated to hardening, they are doing it on rotation. And they, they are solely the dev pair is working on hardening related support or deployment support. So there is no context switching as such. Secondly, for a scoping, if there are any things wherein the team is not comfortable that they have got the best approach, they will call up for a dev adult. And they were anyways calling up for the dev adult. If let's say somebody is doing the development, they are stuck on what is the best approach, they will anyways have a dev adult which will involve this pair which is solely working on hardening. Like when we are when we allocate eight development team members, mm -hmm. they all will be coding and doing testing together, like the unit testing. But we, when we are saying it's pair, it means like two people doing one person's job. Yeah, that's what I previously explained, but let me try to explain in a little different way. So it's not that they are always pairing all the time. So it's like one dev pair has signed up for a story or a feature. Now, if there is a complexity, these two people will be discussing with each other what is the best approach. Or one person is focusing on the strategy and second person is doing the coding or they are writing test cases for each other. So that helps in dealing with the complexity. If they really reach to a end <coughs> wherein there is a low complexity or little complexity, they can just separate and do the work and then you know pull it. So they are not always doing pairing. Is it uh, always so advisable to do pairing? Uh, you know what is the benefits versus uh, you know um, in doing yeah investment in doing pairing versus not doing pairing. So if if we are dealing with the complex pieces of work it is advisable to do the pairing and sometimes even the dev pair is not sufficient to deal with the complexity. So they initially work together and they might call up for a dev adult then all the developers will sit together and talk about what is the best approach. Right. In the previous slide where you were showing multiple releases running together especially in the school back uh, when we
We are taking care of work in progress limit continuously. There are no iterations on this. Now, what is the advantage of say Kalman here? The advantage is because we have got a legacy system. Right? Many times it was not feasible to work on a finish a user story in one week or two weeks time. Now, what is the choice? Either we divide the story, but that story becomes non-shockable. It becomes like a technical task. So that's that's one constraint we have got. Secondly, because of this hardening, because of other things, our backlog was a little more fluid than what we would really like to in this scrum. So that is why we were more comfortable using Kanban. I am not saying using iteration is bad or Kanban is better. All I am saying is using iteration requires a bit more discipline and probably we were not that mature. Yeah, that's a that's a typical pattern that Kanban is more popular in a support kind of environment. There is another pattern which people see using Scrum at a team level and using Lean and Kanban at a portfolio level. That's another pattern. What we are using here is a hybrid model. You might call it Scrum model, probably. Uh, so if I understand it right, uh, then uh, when you say no iteration boundary, so we don't have a sprint backlog here. It's just yeah, a product backlog. We don't have a sprint backlog. We have a back. All right, so even, even though we don't have iteration, we do have cadences. So we have retrospective every four weeks. We have fortnightly planning cadences and showcases. And there are backlog grooming discussion multiple times a week based on the demand. The one of the major concern here was we are still in a you know big governance heavy organization. So the way as Mark was also saying, generally whenever there is a work request, there is a project, there is always a business case and funding side. The people who are do, who are providing the funding, they are not going to just accept that, okay, we'll start with the development, we'll figure it out. So they want answers of how much it is going to cost, how long it is going to take, what is the doability in the beginning itself. But in the beginning, we haven't got the user story. Right? So over a period of time, this was a major struggle. We come up with a simple model. What we did is, we divided the work request into four, five different categories, small, medium, large, extra large. So we tried to put a velocity kind of a model that one, small means 1, medium means 2, large means 3, extra large means 5. And over a period of time we kind of determined the team velocity is roughly 10. Which means we can do 5 mediums or 10 small or any combination. But generally we were slightly wary of doing 2 extra large because that was more risky. We were also factoring other things like risk and external dependencies. Other than that, at a low level the model was quite similar to any typical agile uh, that we got a backlog, we were doing we were using Fibonacci series for estimation, dividing the work request into feature, feature into stories, focusing on the must have, ensuring that at any point of time, any release, we don't have more than 70% must have. Why? Because that feature buffer gives us a lot of flexibility. A lot of flexibility to deal with unknown, a lot of flexibility to accommodate any last minute high priority change. So a lot of people will argue that we are not agile. It's not fully agile. It's semi-agile. Well, my response to that is, probably it is. I don't want to get into that debate. The thing here is, team has really come a long way from what they have got a chaotic model to a model which is working, which is giving value. And team is further working, moving in the right direction. And that is what is most important. Agile is more like a journey rather than a destination. Right? So the next step, what we are planning are, Further automation to reduce hardening, resolving test environment constraint to again reducing hardening, trying to have a robust redundant definition, really having a potential shapeable product and continue with technical enhancement to speed up, further speed up development. If we are able to sort out these things, probably we can move from Kanban kind of model to a little more disciplined scrum kind of model. So with this, I will wrap up giving a quick summary of what we discussed. So first of all, focus on the business problem first. Don't sell agile, just show the way. The people are going to be even more suspicious if we are going to use jargons like sprint, backlog. They will think, what the kind of change you are trying to bring? So just focus on the key principles like frequent delivery, frequent feedback, technical agility. Things will automatically fall in place when you are able to show the way. 
Next is engaged performing organization with a scrum term like pigs and chickens. Lots of people really take it literally. They try to align management with the team. But in my experience, we should always collaborate with performing organization. If you are able to help your bosses to earn brownie points out of team success, they will be definitely your side. And then always focus on technical integrity. We talk a lot about it. And the last point is we should focus on being agile rather than doing agile. When I say doing agile, it's about practices. Obviously, these are important, but more focus should be on doing agile, which means imbibing agile mindset, agile principles. One of the agile mindset or agile principle is continuous adaptation and continuous improvement. So with that, the last thing I would like to say, remember, Agile is a journey rather than destination. So with this, I will wrap up my, I, end, I will end my presentation and the floor is open for any further questions. Do, do we have some time? Okay. So we can take only one or two questions now. Uh, what we can further do is maybe uh, you in the break, you can interact or also uh, put your question on Twitter using the hashtag uh, dad 50 and uh, Chitesh will try to answer the question to you. Yeah, we'll look first to get